So yeah, that's to talk about parent factors. I'm Alejandro, but we have very few time because that's like a lot of slides and a lot of things. And I would rather prefer that if uh, to use the time, if you have some question at, at the mi in the middle, just raise your hand and we can try to figure it out. So, so first, uh, what's the idea of the talk? So we, we, are, we are functional programmers, so functions are first class. We, we can do all sorts of stuff with them. We can use them as arguments. We can return it as values. We can uh, combine functions to get new ones. So we have this combinator which really combine functions to give you new functions. And we can speak about functions without even giving a name, which is like one of the weirdest things I found when I was learning like functional programming. Like why, why would I create a function without a name? That didn't kind of make sense at the beginning, but at the end it does. So, so the question is, can we have first class data types? So can we go even farther, make everything first class because we, th we think that everybody should have the same right. So data types should be there too. And, and the thing is, we have some parts of this. So what do we have? We have, we have parametric polymorphism, which is a fancy way to say that types can depend on other types. So we have this list with our list of some type, and then we give uh, an argument to say which is this type. In, in Haskell, which by the way will be the, the, the the language I will use throughout the talk, uh, we have uh, type families, which are sort of functions at the type level. So we can really have uh, this element which, given a type, give us the type of contained elements. And, and this is like sort of a function. Uh, but we are missing many, many things. So we cannot combine, we cannot easily have a language to combine data types to get new one. We cannot. Uh, express something like uh, what's the shape of a data type without giving it a name. We are always forced to say this is the type list. We cannot say this is a type which has like things and then things and then recursively the same kind of stuff. So we don't have a language directly to do this. And, and, and this talk is about how we can do this. So first of all, so it's, this is part zero of the talk, we have to uh, set up some things and at this point I would recommend you that you just faithfully believe me what I'm saying. So some, this will work out at the end but now it will completely make no sense. Why the hell am I doing this? So the first thing is what we are doing we can do it with functions. So uh, we have this normal factorial function which is recursive and and we are, we are going to think, okay, I don't like recursion at all. It's, it's wrong. So I want to have all my recursion only going through one function that I trust. Ah, I don't like it, but I trust it, which is fixed. And we can do this. We can separate the, from the factorial function and a skeleton which has no recursion and then uh, tie the recursion. So make the loop using this fix. So if you haven't ever seen this, that's the place where you need faith. This actually works, even though you have something like let x equal fx in x, and everything being called x is important for this to work. But the main point is that in factorial, we are replacing the recursion with actually an extra argument, which will be, which represent the recursive uh, calls. So this. When we are calling f here, at the end, when we use fix, this will be tied to be the same factorial function. So at the end, it will work out. So now that we can do this with functions, we can look at data types. And data types have some of the, of the same thing. We have recursive data types, like these arithmetic expressions. And you have some base cases, and you have some point where you make recursion, in this case, uh, you have literals and you have plus or times other expressions. And at that point you also make the recursion. And we can do exactly the same thing. We can break it up in two things. We have uh, some kind of data type that I'm going to call pattern factor, just because it's a bunch of cool words together. Uh, so, and, and we are replacing this recursion by an extra argument, R. So, whereas before we call arith exp all the time, here we are using r. And then we have one data type, one single data type that we have to believe that 
will tie the recursion, which is this fixed data type, which look a bit weird, but this will actually work. So this fix is, is going to tie the recursion at the, at the uh, data type level. Uh, the difference is that uh, before we just write our, so, so imagine we, have, we want to do something like plus, then we have plus one, and here times uh, two and three. And if, if we want to write this sort of uh, thing, uh, Using the, the white data type, we just write this. So we have write plus, literal one. You know it, it's, it's easy. But if we want to use the other part, we have to include one extra constructor each time, which is this in data type. So every time we want to have something, we have, we want to, we have to say, oh, please, I want to do a step, a recursive step. So I will call in and then use one of these things. And by the way, we are tying the recursion, we can ask for a new step to go with another in. So basically, your code ends up looking something like the orange part. We have exactly the same structure, but we have this in extra things. So this thing may look like, OK, we, I'm already telling you to write more code, which is bad, I've heard. Uh, but uh, if, if you're using new version of GHC, you can actually hide all of this uh, with pattern synonyms, which are sort of a way to say, uh, whenever you see times, I want you to, to read this, even in, if you are doing pattern matching. So it's not like just creating a function, it's also creating a way to look at things. So, so some people might be wondering, okay, functors are a nice word, but you shouldn't be using this without even proving me that this thing is a functor. So, uh, these are called pattern factors because actually when you make use these techniques, every time what you get with this extra R argument, it's a functor. So you can always write a definition for this. And this is always look the same. You just make your recursion with fmap uh, on each of the, of the parameters of the, of the R type. So this construction will always be a functor. It's, it's not important that it, this is always, well, will be important later on. But this was always yields a functor. Actually, this is so simple kind of functor that GHC can also derive it yourself. So you don't have to write this code. So, so okay. Now, I assume that you are going. Do you have believed me that you can do this with data types? So do you split this recursion from the patterns? Uh, so have we gained something? So at this point, we have already gained something. So imagine that. I want to have this kind of trees, but I want to add some information at each point, at, at each node. So I, I just want to, to add a, a translation into Spanish because somebody is, is going to read this. So I want to add here like a string and, and, and here, is it in Spanish? Yes. So, uh, so I want to add this thing. So if, if you think about it, this is not actually changing the structure of my patterns. It's just at each point, I want to introduce a tag. So this is changing. It, this is not changing the structure of the data type. It's changing the way I am doing the recursion. I want to do recursion in which at each point, I want to attach an extra tag. So I can do this if we have a pattern factor instead, instead of a recursive data type. I just change my fixed point. So I just change my my purple part and my patterns are still the same. So I can reuse the same data types over different kind of trees structures. So of course, now when I create a value, I have to attach all the, all the extra tags, but I can do this and the pattern function does not change. So we have already won something. But we can also uh, use this technique to have more generic functions. So, uh, what we are going to, to try to do now is to, to create some kind of generic fold function. So if you look at fold functions, you have fold R like list, or you have fold A, which is a fold over my arithmetic expressions. And, and if you write this thing, so this is this thing which traverse the tree and sort of put together the information and at the end when it just becomes one piece of data. So you will notice, and this is shown uh, on, on uh, orange and green, that there are 
there is always the same skeleton. So you have uh, these types, which are always like my pattern functor. So you see integer r, 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 r. So that's exactly my pattern, the shape of my pattern functor. And then they return this value r. And if you look at the list, so how, how is the pattern of a list? It's either uh, a and a recursion or just nil, which has no nothing. So yeah, like my, the second orange part in Foldar is just invisible because there is nothing. And you notice that every time I always called this same function in the recursive position. So there is some kind of structure hidden here. And actually, we can uh, write it easily. So the same, the same fold that was so long to write for every data type, we can write it once and for all for every data type and with a purple thing. So it's just one liner. But this is more generic because now instead of just any kind, one specific data type, we have any data type which is represented by this p. So this p is our, uh, our pattern factor. So if you take this and instantiate it to a list, you will get your fold R. If you instantiate it to uh, arithmetic expressions, you will get your fold A. By the way, this is called, these uh, things which go from P of R to R are called algebra. So this really doesn't matter, but if you heard about algebra, some programming and bananas, lenses, and all these kind of things, this is all about this kind of, of stuff. So we, we just uh, wrote the same thing with just one line. And, and you see that there is a recursive call. So we are calling default inside. And, and why, we need, why we need it at the beginning things to be a functor is because when we are doing this, we are applying things in these two positions, which are the, the, the positions in which we are functors over. And in the other place, we do the same thing. So we need some way to, to do this mapping, and we do this with fmap. So this is why we need things to be pattern functors. So if we want to do something like, please give me the, what is the result of this expression, we can do this by using uh, default for arithmetic expressions instead of writing the, the all the skeleton, we only have to go to the, to the essentials part, what you do for each constructor. So if you have a literal, you have n. If you have plus and x and y are going to be the results of the computation that go upwards, you're just go, going to add them up. And if you have time, you are going to multiply them. So, so we have here two things that we can already do with pattern factor. We, have, uh, we, have, we can change the fixed point and then attach new things, or we can create generic folds. So now uh, I, I, I hope I've already convinced you that this technique is going to go get us somewhere. So now we're going to see three uh, bigger uh, things where we can use this, this idea of pattern factors. And the first one is, is uh, coming from, from the question, how do I put constructors together? So I imagine I have, I have this plus and, and times, but somehow I want to add some new operation like exponentiation. So I can define a pattern factor for exponentiation, but how can I push them together, put them together so you have one data type which has like all constructors together. And this technique is called data types a la carte. So as I said, our aim is extensibility. So we have the pattern, the pattern factor above, which where I'm splitting the literal from the operations and we would like to have some kind of plus, call it combined plus, whatever, some kind of, uh, of combinator which put constructors together. So our arithmetic expressions are going to be just like the fixed point of these two things put together. So imagine plus is just putting things together. And if we then want to uh, add minus and division, then we just put it together with a new plus. So this is getting us extensible data types. At each point, we can decide, oh, wait a minute. I, for this thing, I need one extra constructor. So I'll put it inside, and then I will combine with plus. So can we define plus? H how should plus look? So if you think about it, if you have two functors, basically what I have to tell you 
what you have to tell me at each point is which of them are you using. So you can use either literals or plus and, and times. So just tell me, oh, I'm using literal. Oh, then you're allowed to use literal. I'm using plus. So you're allowed to use plus. And you can do this with this green definition. So uh, this combination of these two patterns factor f and g is either please go to the left, so choose the, the, the pattern on the left, so then you give me an f, and, and or you go to the right and then you give me a g. So that's everything uh, you really need to know, which one you chose at each point. And, and, and the nice thing of this is that this construction uh, still returns the, function, the functoriality. So if you have two functors, the combination is still a functor. And, and this is sort of uh, a strange uh, looking code if, if, if you are not used to this thing because the f map on each f map has a different type. So, so uh, it looks like I could write the, the same stuff for the first and the second things, but I cannot because really the, the types involved are different. But this tells us that if we have two functors and we compose it with plus, we have a new pattern functor. So we can still compose it with another plus, or we can do our fixed point, or we can do our false, or we can do our tagging. So we are still in, in the same kind of, of thinking. The problem now is that our values require at each point to tell whether you want to go left or right. So what, what before was a bit annoying to have all these ins, then now you have to have the ins and the go r or go l. So this is quite, quite annoying if, if you want to use it all the time, especially because if you, if you are combining a new functor, now you have to say go left, go left, or go left, go right. And you know, it's scale. If you have like four, then you will have to do several combinations. So this is a bit tricky. There is a solution for this, which I'm just going to tell you that it exists. So there, there, you can define functions that inject a data type f in, into anything that has f inside. So you sort of, uh, it seems reasonable that if I have literals, if I have something that is built only with literals, then I can make it into something which has literal and any more, any more stuff around. So uh, you can define these functions and this is the, 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 how you solve this problem because if, if we had something before which only have something, you just call injection and you make it in as bigger as you want. So the detail, there are many details uh, to construct this, so you can read them in, in any, in any uh, these two, two articles. But so I, they, are, they are nice to read, but we don't have the time uh, today. Uh, no, we don't have the time. Uh, so OK, we have extensible data types. That's cool. But if you have extensible data types, you would like to have extensible functions because you would like to say, oh, I have a function like evaluate, and then I have my literals, and I know how to evaluate my literals, and then I have my arithmetic operation, and I know how to evaluate them. And somehow, since our, our uh, so you could write these functions, but it will be tied to one specific uh, functor. We don't know yet how to have like a part specifically for one functor, and then for the other factor, and then how to combine these functions together. So, so the question is, we got extensible data types. Can we write functions that are extensible over these data types? And this is extremely easy. Well, extremely easy depends on, of course, on our definition, what you find easy. But this is all the code you need to write eval. So basically, the idea is that now our function is going to be defined as a type class. So this type class is the type class or fun of functors that know how to evaluate themselves, which are evaluable somehow. So each of these have to give me a definition for the function eval, eval underscore. So ac actually, what, we need to, what they need to give me is another algebra. Oh, it's interesting. Uh, well, I find it interesting at least. And so uh, you see that, that now we can write a definition of a ball for the literals and the operations, and these are, yeah. Yeah, so basically what, what we are left is we, we know how to tell or how to evaluate literals, how to evaluate operations, but we need some extra boilerplate code, which is how do we evaluate a composition of functors? 
And this is always looks strikingly similar. There's always something like this. If you think about it, you either go to the left or to the right, and then you say, oh, if I go to the left, please call the valuation on the type of the left. But this is taken care by the type class system. So this eval will call the thing which is on the left, will call uh, the eval on f. Or if you go to the right, please call eval on the right. So, uh, and, and the last thing you need to do is, OK, we have a, ba a val for p of integer. But what we really want to have is, is uh, so for, for p, but what we really have is something that is the fixed point of p. So it's going to be fixed of p. So you need to unwrap this fur of, uh, sorry, it shouldn't be fixed. It's right in there, sorry. Uh, so you have to unwrap this in operation that we had before. And you just do it by calling a ball and then recursively calling a ball on the subtree. So you are tying the recursion again at this point. So, so this is how you can write a extensible function. You just have to think beforehand that your data type is going to be extensible. So you write it as a pattern factor. And then you can combine them and get extensible functions. And actually, these functions are really extensible. So if you now add exponentiation, you add the functor, you add the, the instance for evaluation, and then you don't have to change anything. You don't have to change the instance for combination. You don't have to change a ball. So a ball is still the same stuff. So I think this is pretty cool. And, and, and yeah, the, I, I think this is a small digression, but I think it's interesting to, to, to know where these techniques come from. And this has come from, from trying to solve what is called the expression problem uh, of, of, of programming languages. So we have object-oriented programming, we have functional programming, and, and, and somehow they, they have different trade-offs. So if you have, uh, have object-oriented programming, it's very easy to add sort of a new constructor to a data type. You just subclass it, and then you have Animals and you add a dog and add a cat, and then you can do this without modifying the animal. The problem is if you want to have some uh, some new function which is which works across all animals, then you have to change the animal class so you can uh, subclass it in all the rest. So you sort of have it's easy to subclass to add new constructor, but it's very complicated to add new functions, and so you need to modify what you had at the at the beginning. And there are these extension methods which allow you to do some of this stuff. And in FP, it's completely the opposite. It's very easy to add a new function. You just add it, whatever you, you need it. You don't need to, to tell any data type that you want to a new function operating on it. But if you want to add a new constructor to a data type, this becomes impossible. You have to modify the source code. And this is bad, because we, we need to go to whatever wrote the source code and, and see that everything compiles again. So this uh, data type a la carte is, a w is something that the FP community came to solve this problem on, the, on, functional, on functional languages. OK, so that's one, one thing we can do with pattern factors. So let's go to something new, which is to build free things, especially a free monad. So I'm not trying to tell you what a free thing is. There is a talk uh, after this, which will tell you much better than I do. But I need you to, to get at least the intuitive feeling of what a free thing is. What do we say when we have a free monad, a free monad, free whatever? So, so the idea is we have a class. We have a class x. And we want to say what a free x is. So a free x is going to be just a parametric data type. So a, a data type free x would take a type a. So, and, and then we want to be able to define an instance every time for this free x, so we want to make free x an instance of x with the less amount of conditions. So, uh, so we want our conditions to be nothing or the, 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 the smaller they can. And if conditions is some other kind of concept, then we speak about the free x over y. So let me make an example. So we speak about the free monoid over a type and y why list is a free monoid over a type is because for every list of A, we can define an instance of monoid. And we don't have any condition. So our condition is just to be a type. So we can, we can define it this way. So uh, 
it's important I'm speaking about a free monoid, not the free monoid, which is a much more stronger thing to say about something. So I'm not claiming that this is the free monoid. And you can you have long runs in the Haskell Cafe mailing list about what's exactly the free monoid in Haskell, uh, which is not actually the list. But OK, the point is we want to define free monads. So what should a free monad look like? There sh it should be a data type, free monad, which takes an f. And given some conditions for f that we want to, we want to figure out, we want to write, return, and bind for this, for this data type. So, so our first guess would be, uh, you are speaking to me about this fix thing. Let's try with fix. So it fix takes an f. And we have this fault operation, which sort of resembles the bind operation. With sort of resembles might be, depends on, on what you, you think about it. So, uh, but you have some problems. First of all, a monad needs an extra type. So you need to have fix of f of a. So, uh, because now you cannot define return. So how will you return any a into fix of f? Fix of f only have values of the, fun of the functor f. And, and also another problem is that default does not change its type. But this is also the, the, same, the same problem. There is no extra type variable to change. So it doesn't change its type. So, so we can think about, OK, what we need. We need some extra thing that saves value of type a. So let's include it. So let's use our idea of an extensible uh, data type to add a whole of type A. So now your free monad is not only going to be things of the pattern factor F, it's going to be things of the pattern factor F of an A, which is like in its own world. So it's, it's a whole there. So you can see that the, that the type whole is also a pattern factor, but it's completely disregarding whatever the, the x is. So it's always be a constant type A. So if you add it to it, then you can write a free monad definition. So we have any functor. We added a whole. And we know how to add a whole because we know how to add data types now. And by combining this, we get a free monad. Unfortunately, you, this is not valid Haskell. And why it's not valid Haskell is because when you have a a type defined like this, you cannot partially apply this. So it's, it's not legal to write free monad of f. We, only have to, we always have to write free monad of f of a. It, it really requires us to uh, use the synonym fully, not, not just a part of it. So uh, if, you, if you look to the, to the definition of a free monad over a functor, which by the way is the condition we figure out, we only need functor f. If you uh, look at the definition, you will find something like this, which is just <coughs> expanding what we had. So it's either return, which is the, this whole, or it's either a recursive, which is a fix over this free monad. So this is just expanding this thing to, to, to please the Haskell compiler. And we can write the same, the same stuff here. So we have a functor, and you have a free monad over f. So what's the deal with free monads? Why everybody loves free monads? It's, I haven't told you about that. I just thought, oh, these people want to know about free monad regardless of its utility. But there is an utility on this. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I even like to think that free things are a design pattern of the Haskell language. So, uh, so if you have something like operation, so in this case, you have a key value store. You can represent the operation that some, this store can perform as a free monad over a specific functor. And this functor is the thing that, that uh, represents the operations. So if, if you have some kind of system, you have the, the basic operations, and you usually have all kind of skeleton to combine operations. So you can sequence them, you can perform them in parallel. And this is given by this free monad structure. So I, what, what can this? key value store do? It can either get a value, so you give it a, 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 a key, and then it gives you a value you can use to apply to a function. So that's the v to r. Or you can just put a key with a value in the store. So 
if you now define the free monad, but you get it sort of a way to define programs that use this key value store. And, and this is an example of it. So this is put in three and then get in three. And with the result of three, it will just, it will just return whatever it got. So this is, this is how you can use a, a functor to define a free monad. And this represents sequential, well, operations over this kind of basic primitives in your, in your language. Uh, usually, you don't want to write this example in this way. You would like to write this. But you can uh, do a sort of mechanical transformation by just calling return at the end of everything. So it's, it's not very complicated to do this. Uh, and you can, you can always do this to get a more monadic uh, interface. So what, what you got from this? So this thing only represents the operation, but it doesn't perform any operation. So example isn't actually looking into any database. It's just telling you, it's just describing a program which does something in a database. So that means that you can interpret your description in different ways. So you can do it in a real machine. So you can say, oh, I have like a key value store connection and I will, every time I have a get, I will actually get it from the, from the key value store. Or if I have a put, I will put it on the key value store. But you could also find another interpretation that mocks the operation. And this is great for testing. So I will define something which just recalls these things on a list. So if I have to test my system, I can just create sort of a unit test, run it through mock KV, and figure out whether the result is what I was expecting without actually having to run anything on a database. And I think this is an important lesson to be learned. At least I, I think that's one of the things that Haskell empowers me to do. That you can separate completely representing programs from interpreting programs. And, and usually the, the good thing is that uh, representations of a program tends to be instances of general concepts like functors, like monad. They always have these kind of same structures. And interpretations, well, even interpretation are always kind of false. So you, can, you could have defined this as generic false. But the nice thing is you can have several of these interpretations. You don't have to boil anything down into the system. And well, as you, as you may know, Haskell doesn't only give you free monads. It gives you a lot of other things for free. So you can look at the free package by Edward Kemet. And you have free monads, free monads, free, free whatever. You can, kind of do this kind of stuff. I, I think that the free monad is the m most useful one be because of this uh, thing which you can interpret, but, you can, but, but uh, you can have more of this construction and figure out how this should be. And this is, I think this is a nice, a nice thing to do. So, so, OK. This is, uh, of course, awesome. So why the hell doesn't my compiler allow me to do this? From the beginning, why can I use my data types as first class data types? I would like to do this. Now I need to do this. So, <clears throat> and if you think about it, that, that's very clear. Because what, what, what you do when you do the writing show is you want to write a show instance. But you could have written this if you know what is the pattern factor. You only know, need to know what's the pattern factor. The rest is always the same. Just ask parentheses and, and recurse. So why don't you do this? So actually. Uh, we can do this, and I will show you how. So oh, let me check the time. Oh, I can even tell you this slowly. So, uh, so we, we know how to express choice. So we have this plus operation that allows us to say, oh, I want to have this, this functor or this other functor. So we can sort of say, I want a literal, a plus, or a times. but we don't know how to describe its, con its constructor. So we don't have a generic way to say, oh, this has an integer, and this has an r, and an r, and an r. So what we are, what we are looking uh, forward is to have something like this. So we have this plus, which is like an or, represent a choice of constructor. And then inside every part, we want to define what is the structure of the constructor. So for this, we need some some things. So we need, first of all, uh, some way to, to, to say, oh, this is a recursion. So we can think, oh, there is some kind of recursive pattern factor which represents this. Uh, I will show you later how we can define this. Just 
uh, try again, have a bit of faith that this will work out. Uh, we have this. Uh, we have this hole. We had before the hole, which represent a constant thing. We, we, we can represent this thing that oh, here is an integer. Oh, here is a hole for an integer. And what we need to, uh, also is to put something together. So we need to have sort of a tuplin, but we need this to be extensible. So we have to have some kind of and operation. So what we had before that are arithmetic expressions. They are now, uh, th this is going to be represented this way. So you either have an integer or two recursive position or two recursive positions. And we, we, we forget completely about the names of the, of the constructor. They are not important in this case because we can always know what we have chosen by means of knowing if we've gone left, right, in this case, or left, left. So, so OK, this combination actually exists and they have this nice property that you can you get you give it two functors and you get a new functor so we know about holes we know about choice we have a product of functors which is just two things together so if you have f and g applied over a because this needs to be a functor then it's f of a or g of uh, a there it is uh, we have we can always express, we can re express recursion, but if we remember, we express recursion later on the fixed point by this R operation. So we only actually need to, to have the same operation here. So this R is really like an identity. You, you do nothing to the, to the parameter. And, and then, well, if we are going to do this uh, to the end, then we also need some extra thing for a uh, constructor with have no information. So how would you represent uh, a list with only this, without this? Well, you cannot do this because you cannot express something like nil. You cannot say, oh, this has no information attached because you always have to choose some of these functors. So we need to express an extra one, which is unit, which is like nothing, no information attached here. So we just forget about our A completely. And doing this, we have anonymous data types. So we have data types in which we don't give it a name. We only give it a structure, a shape. So our list can be represented as either unit, so that's the nil case, or a cons, which is a whole of type A and then recursion. And then our lists are going to be fixed of this thing. And if, if you want to go all the way down, you can define uh, nil and cons as just synonyms of this thing. So when you have nil, it's just you go to the left, so you go to the first case, and well, you have nothing to say. You have only have unit. Or if you want to have a cons, you have to go to the right, so you have uh, uh, yeah, the, the second one, and then you either you have to give it a hole and then the recursive thing. The fixed point will take care of this uh, working in the way it should. So you can do this also for arithmetic expressions. So uh, you, you, you can define it as, as either a whole integer or two recursive position for plus or two recursive position for rec. And you just can do the same thing with pattern synonyms to have the same name you had before. So the nice thing is that GHC already gives you this. So it just only gives it shorter names, which I think are not shorter just because you want to write less, it's because you want to look more clever. Because of course, if you know what KCP is you are strictly more clever than if you know what hole is, which uh, it's a hole. <laughs> so that's that's the names that it gives. So uh, instead of well, the sum and the product are the same, and instead of go left and go right, they call it L1 and R1, and there is a reason why they are called L1 and R1 and not L and R directly. But yeah, that let's just make it a, another day. So. Uh, so we have units, we have products. So now we, have, we actually have all the building blocks to have first class data types on our compiler. So uh, the only thing that is missing is that if you write Haskell code, you usually write normal data types. So you, you wouldn't write list in doing a pattern function and then taking the fixed point and writing the pattern synonym. So you want to use normal Haskell code, uh, apart from the fact that it's completely irrelevant that it will, using this will be like 10 times lower, but 
Yeah. Whatever. Uh, so uh, what they did in GHC is okay, it's telling you, OK, if, if you want to work with your normal data types, do it. And if you want to use these generic representations, please give me a way to convert from your data type to a generic representation. So this is the generic type class, which is like the whole idea we've been working on on the compiler. So you have to give me, if, if A is generic, if A can be described with all these fancy pattern functors, you have to give me what is the representation. So if you haven't seen this, this type in a class, uh, forces you to, to, to give a, ta a definition of a type when you implement this class. So it's sort of a, a method, well, not a method. It's a method which is a type. It's like a, a function which should return a type. And this is an, called an associated type family. A and then you have to give ways to convert from A to the generic representation and the other way around. So this is, this is how you want to do this. So if, if you think about it, if, if you want to give the instance for list, so we already have seen what is the instance for list. So we have to give an unit and then a whole and a recursive position. So this is how this is done. So there is just one a small detail. Uh, generics don't use this fix operation. Instead, when you have uh, a recursive position, you just say, oh, this is like a constant of the recursive type. So you have here k1 of the type list of a. So this is a, a small difference. And why you do this is a small different style. So I think the, the, the other one is a clearer style, but this one, uh, it's a bit more performance. So you want to lose some of your performance, but maybe not all of them, all of it. So and, and then if you have to give, tell me how you move from nil and cons to the generic representation and the other way around. So, OK, you want to use this technique. But seriously, are you going to write this code? So are you going to get a scrap piece of paper, figure out what is my pattern factor, let's write everything. And, and imagine you have like, I don't know, imagine you have something with more than two things, which actually will mean that this will span like three lines. That's terrible. So. Yeah, just ask the compiler to do it for you because this is automated. So you can add derived generic at the top of your source file in Haskell and say, oh, please derive generic for me. So yeah, if I want to give you all this thing for my arithmetic expressions, I will just write this. And it will generate all the code for this. So, so we are good. We don't have to work uh, too much. We only have to add, well, one line per thing because the, the other one you only have to one per source file, so this is amortized about all your, so if you put all your data types in, in just one big file, this is like completely negligible cost. So, so then we can use the same techniques, this data types a la carte approach to define data type generic equality. So you have this deriving EQ, which does it for you, but you could have written it directly by using this data type uh, generic kind of stuff. So this is exactly the same thing. So you have to give a, a type class. And then for each of the possibilities, which now are not, they are not any kind of pattern factor. They are our basic pattern factors, u1, k1, uh, plus, and times. You say what you want to do. And, and if you think about and this is how you would actually think about a structural comparison. So this is telling you, OK, if I have Two tuples, they are equal if they are equal in both their components. If you have a choice of constructor, these are equal if they choose the same constructor and then their information inside are equal, which is exactly what you are saying there. So if you have L1 and L1, then you continue looking. But if, you, if they are different, then you already know that they are not equal and you can give false as an answer. So this is uh, how you implement equality usually and how you think about it. And then the only thing that is missing is a wrapper, because if you want to use equality, you, would, you don't want people to, to know that you are doing all these generic combinations. So you want a wrapper which calls from here. And of course, you need it to, to have generic here, but uh, people have to write the right generic. I think it's a fair amount of code they have to write to be able to use this. The, the problem is, uh, OK. You can implement equality. 
but you cannot implement show. That's what I said I would uh, let you know how to do it. And the problem is that we know how to choose a constructor, but we lost the information about the name of the constructor. So what is the name? Uh, is it a field? How, how should we need all this information to be able to, to derive a, a show instance. So what, what uh, GHC does is add a new constructor, M1, M1 from metadata, which just uh, does nothing. So it doesn't record any information on the, on the value level. So you have nothing else to do, only an M1 extra uh, in, your, in your data type. But, but this I and C, uh, by the way, this is called this is ICFP, which is the name of the International Conference of Functional Programming, and I think this was a pun from the writer of, of, of this thing. But but anyway, this is information about your data type. So if you uh, go to a GHCI, you can actually do this if you have I think from version seven point eight or something like this, and you and you say well kind of rep bool, which means that please give me the type which results of this type family from this type function rep applied on bool. You give me the kind and this and this uh, exclamation mark tells you, please also give me the type, not only the kind of the type. You will get something like this. And you see that this, what you would expect is two constructor which has no information, which are true and false, and you can choose about it. But there is some metadata which recalls the name. So if you ask data type name, from true, so uh, you need to give it a, a, a value, but you have true, you, uh, then you get bo uh, bool. So it recalls what the data type name. And if you uh, ask for constructor name, it will also tell you the constructor. So with this you can, and you have more information. So what's the model it was defined? Is it a, a defined as a record? All this information. With this you can, you can implement a lot, a lot of stuff. You can uh, implement equality, functor, traversable, all of this in a generic way. You can do serialization to JSON. You can do to binary. So you just add, derive generic, and then you can use all this stuff for free. Uh, you can do, use deep evaluation. You can, uh, uh, you can use a, a very nice package I wrote, uh, which sort of uh, extends regular expressions into regular expressions which speak about any kind of data type. So you can sort of say, oh, please, does this match the, the shape of having a plus and then all this kind of stuff. You can even have generic uh, diff functions that work over any data type. You can have uh, generic rewriting, generic transformation from one data type to other, all of this generically. Uh, but there is just one piece of warning. So there are many libraries for, for generic programming in Haskell, so these kind of things. So I usually like GHC generics because it has been one of the, the, the newest ones. So there has been several iterations of this idea and then they thought, oh, this is good enough to go into our compiler. But there are many other, there's regular and multi-rec and then you have scrap your boilerplate which is like a different completely approach based on folds. Uh, the newest one, the new kit on the block is generic SOP for some of products and these have all the same ideas, reformulated in a slightly different way. So if you are going to use this, uh, uh, this is a piece of warning. There are many choices to be done, and it's completely non-clear for anybody what you should be using. Yes. Uh, and I only spoke uh, of this for data type, which has like rec one recursion. So if you want to define like mutually recursion, yeah. So what I was saying, so this work, what I've shown you only works for simple data types, so Haskell 98 data types which only have like single recursion, no mutual recursion like these data types need a type of this and this, this one, no GADTs. So you can do this if you, if you uh, don't have a headache about the, uh, after this talk and you want to know, just feel free to ask me. It, it's, it's not that difficult. So in summary, what, what we see is that we can make our data type first class object. So there is no more discrimination in our language. Everything is super first class. Uh, and we do this by looking at a data type as a pattern factor plus a fixed point. And then uh, this gives us extensibility of both data types and function using this approach that is called data types a la carte, which is just having this type class and then having instances for all of this. And this is embodied by the GHC compiler and you can derive 
uh, these things. We have also seen some free monads which just use this constructor by adding some extra structure. But if, if after all of this, which is a nice technique, the takeaway I would like you to, to have is that the free monad thing is really, really, really useful in like real world things because you can represent your operation and interpret and this is completely separated. So it's very nice from a modularity point of view. So it, yeah, I also have homework because you know, I, I work in the university, so I'm, I, I'm, I sort of mislead by this kind of, of talks thing. So you can, you can read these this papers, they are, they are nice and easy to read. You can wander uh, around the, the free package which shows all of this construction and it's nice documented. You can browse, uh, you can basically read a lot of information about this and this has a lot of documentation about how you apply this. Uh, yeah, and, and, and if you are writing Haskell code, uses techniques to write less code that at the same time is more extensible code. So complete gain. So thanks. That's all.